Hello, hello. Good morning, everyone. Okay, let me try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, ooh, so much excitement. Um, on behalf of the team uh, at Kunsthal, welcome to this uh, artist talk uh, with media artist and director Refik Anadol. Um, I'm very excited about the, this one, and I think you too, because you showed up with so many people uh, this morning, and that's so great to see. My name is Dimfi Brown. I'm a program maker. I organize events about architecture and design. And you often also find me on stage hosting talks about um, digital culture, uh, visual arts, and storytelling. So exactly three months ago, not knowing that I would be here today, um, I paid a visit to Kunsthal to check the um, uh, multi-sensory installations uh, by Rafik. Um, and he's known to be one of the most groundbreaking artists in the world of art, technology, and AI. And Living Paintings Nature, uh, the exhibit uh, that we're currently showing at Kunsthal, is his first solo exhibition in the Netherlands, so that already deserves an applause. I just want to check, who has already visited the exhibition? Okay, okay, that's not even half. Exciting to see then what you will think of it uh, later on. Um, well, I don't know about you, the people who already visited, but his work left me in awe and wonder. And also, um, it left me looking for all those hidden layers that were also uh, um, in his work uh, to be found. Um, and I'm apparently not hoping, or not, apparently I'm not the only one uh, hoping to find those uh, hidden layers, um, because uh, as soon as Kunsthal announced this art artist talk. I mean, you weren't sleeping. This event was sold out like in no time. So happy that you're with us today. Um, before I'm gonna invite Rafik to the stage, um, for everyone who couldn't be here, so tell your friends, this event will be recorded. Um, that also means, and the beautiful thing is we also have an interactive moment. You can ask questions uh, later on. That also means that we want you to use the mic so everyone in the room can hear, but also everyone watching this later can hear your question. Uh, therefore, Fierle and um, Laila, they are over there. They will run around with uh, mics. So just wait a little bit longer till the mic is with you. Um, we have until 12.30ish, um, and Rafik will uh, give a presentation first, and after that, we have a lot of questions, uh, time for questions of you. Um, so that's all for now. We are really happy to announce that he is here with us today. Can I heard you can clap really loud. So do that again, but then twice as loud. Give a welcoming round of applause for Refik Anadol. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Rafik, that was twice as loud and twice as long, so Thank you. this is perfect. How are you feeling today? I'm very excited, uh, heartbeat high, but in a good way. Uh, so and I'm very excited to be here yeah. because I got so many beautiful messages uh, from you and from people, so the exhibition. So I'm so in love and respect to the community. I'm bringing that joy, hopefully. Today. Yeah, well, I already felt that it's a really lovely crowd to be bringing good vibes. Um, so I hope your heart rate goes down a Hopefully. little bit in a second. Um, Rafik, you prepared a beautiful presentation for us. Um, and afterwards, we can have a seat and uh, answer some questions from the audience. So without further ado, unless you want to add anything more beforehand. No, thank you very much. Ready to just... Click the button Let's and just go. show the uh, action then. Well, so uh, take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, 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 just, I just saw this in my dream. 
in a deep jungle in rainforest Amazonia. And I will remi I'll, I'll remind you this moment, end of my slides, why I think this was important. So, I'm a media artist, and I'm Refik, uh, coming originally from Istanbul, Turkey, which I believe one of the most inspiring city where the West and the East connect. The city is so important in my life because this Bosphorus, I think, in my work, you will see a lot of like, molecules moving with the water fluids. It's super simply coming from this experience. Because to me, going to school, coming from school, going to work, the life was always on a water. So the city also, I think, symbolized many cultures coming together, from the mid Middle East to Asia, to far, to the Europe and beyond. I think the city has a very significant, uh, inspiring moment to me. I was very fortunate to grow up with a family of teachers. So in my family, I think I had more than 10 plus teachers. So learning to learn was like a default thing. Like there is no way to not to learn. But what was to me very inspiring um, was uh, my aunt. Unfortunately, she lost her vision very early ages. And I was also her eyes. So growing with a family of someone I love and respect, she was not able to read too much, but she was able to see 10% maybe. And then uh, over the years, I learned, I guess, so much about explaining the world around us to her. And very nerd start, very cheesy start, but I get one of my first computer eight years old. And I didn't know literally too much about English or other languages, but my mom, coincidentally, as a, as a gift for a birthday, gave me one of the most amazing thing in my life, a computer. So I started using computer early ages, and I started dreaming about, I guess, Machine as a collaborator at the early ages. And the, I think the idea of a machine as a collaborator, AI as a collaborator, is not just like a hype or a technology thing. I think it started at the very early ages. And I think this movie, maybe you can see, The Blade Runner, which is a very important thing in my life. I was again eight years old, the same year. My mom randomly brought a VHS cassette back in time. And I didn't know English. My cousin translated the movie to me. I hope he did a good job. I learned that there are incredible stories. But as a child, as we all know, we don't see dystopia. As a child, we see hope, we see utopia. The reason in my work and in my life I try to hold myself is not try to like ignore what is dystopia. Try to see the beauty and the things that we cannot see every single day. And my early works were pretty much focusing on um, in the, in the grad, undergrad years, tried to make installations. And I think because of my childhood, I was always seeing my room after the last of playing games. When I look at my like, walls and I remember the windows and the ceiling and the floor, they were all looking so boring. Every morning they were the same thing. And I was, I think, start questioning, why are they the same? And my mom even brought me to a psychologist, like saying, like, why is he looking the walls so long? And he was just saying, it was just imagination. So, so I had these very funny stories in, in, in the family. But I think this project was my first attempt to understand how can I reflect back the idea of the future of architecture. I am in love with architecture, and I believe architecture is beyond just concrete, glass, and steel, and light can be an amazing material when it is used purposefully. So early studies explored the idea of transforming iconic buildings from saunas, and many others, and find ways of creating new contexts and make lots of installations using architecture as a canvas. And around those days, I learned this software called the VVVV, for V, for anyone want to learn, it's a PC-based visual programming language. And I think 2008, in my undergrad class, I was able to program with a software called Pure Data. It was a moment I remember when I plugged this ultrasound sensor. It was the first time I was seeing that the signals around us, like super simple, I mean, it was for a undergrad student, I was able to like move my hand on a sensor and it was making a whole new light field or like a field of movement in wavelengths. To me, I think that was the class I start talking about data painting. But the, the, the story of, I mean, Kierkegaard said this very well, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. I think at the moment our life with data is exactly this. We leave behind us many information. The machines around us creating a whole new life. I think I'm really obsessed with the idea of data started 2008. But to me, when I think about data, I don't think just numbers. I think data is beyond just numbers. I think data for humanity is a form of memory. And this memory can take any shape and any form. 
to really explain this, I want to show you some examples. My very first, I think, data sculpture was 2011. These are the sound data from the Istanbul, one of the most important parts of the city, where the celebration, the protest, the, the, the religions, all kind of sound of the city was happening in that place. So my first attempt was, how can I take the layers of the sound data and transform it into a three-dimensional sculpture? And of course, my truly inspiration comes from the early games was the questioning the reality. I think the reality itself from the James Trell, Robert Irwin, Don Flavin, many artists question this. But to me, when I come back to this idea of like what we have in front of us is with the machines right now, was completely changing. So you will see frame in my work, which in this also exhibition, it was actually a rejection from a curatorial board because I was trying to put a frame around the building in 2011. And they said, it's a crazy idea, we cannot afford it, please forget this concept. And the concept became a kind of a <laughs> process over the years. And I start using data of sound and try to create worlds around that. But at the moment, the world is constantly changing, and the machines that we every single day work, and, and, and the amount of information around us is becoming incredibly beyond what we can imagine. And especially what I found so inspiring, when the physical and the virtual worlds connect, I found so much meaning, so much, so much interesting world that I think we can explore. But when it comes to technology, I think I'm truly fascinated by how it's changing every single day. I mean, as, a, as an artist, I grew up with invention of internet. I saw web one, web two, web three. <laughs> I saw the invention of AI, quantum computation. I mean, imagine the living in the age of artists like decades and centuries ago. How incredible thing that how you cannot stop to respond every morning and even innovation happening. But at the meantime, I know that <laughs> many of us like this. So we are becoming these new beings. I think we are becoming new things that the machine constantly allow us to go places that we are, who knows if we are going. But I think the control is changing. And especially, I think, we are becoming these new beings where we sometimes don't know where we are. And I love this moment of sense of displacement. So the work that you will be seeing is also like very interestingly making us there. But I found that narrative so powerful and so meaningful. 2012, I decided to deep dive in this medium. I thought that I needed much more education to understand the medium. I was looking for what, what is next I could do. 2012, I was very sure that I need to work with the people that I know doing public art. So my work, as you see, public art. I love to be on the streets. I love to be truly around the buildings, and, but not in the buildings. And I was so inspired to go to the city that Blade Runner, as an eight years old, was calling me. And when I go to the city, <laughs> I was like this. So, so generally, you know, students are in the art schools, most likely painting and sculpting and working so hard. To me, I was on the streets with the cables, hacking projectors and finding ways to get some cheap gears and just make quick, quick, quick like experiments. So to me, public art is everything. Because public art means to me art for anyone, any age, any background. And over the years, of course, my love to architecture, I know that the city of Los Angeles has this building by Frank Gehry. It's the home of Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. It's the cultural beacon of the city. And when I moved to Los Angeles, the first thing I did, put my luggage in my dormitory and rent a car and went to downtown to see the building. It was my dream, one of the surfaces. And what happened was so funny, I just arrived 2 a.m., which is at midnight, and the building was completely dark. At 1.59, every day, <laughs> they shut off the lights, and I saw the building completely in dark. It was an amazing moment, because that was exactly the moment I knew that I one day want a project on this building. I hope this building can dream, can hallucinate, can remember. And suddenly, <laughs> one year later, while I was studying with the Christian Moller, Casey Rias, Rebecca Allen, those are my heroes, and they are one of the most incredible media artists teaching at UCLA, design media arts department. My mentor, Christian Muller, said, like, maybe your idea is pretty intense. I mean, a student coming from Turkey, trying to project on a Disney hall, Frank Gehry's building, that's not normal. Like, I emailed Frank Gehry, of course. I emailed LA Philharmonic as a student. I mean, putting those projectors is very, very challenging things. And, but my person said, like, maybe this is the place you may go, but normally, Microsoft Research every year inviting to this special event that students are sharing their dreams. Mostly product services, apps, and all that, like, technological stuff. But I was the only one on the stage as an artist. And what I said was, 
I hope, buildings can dream and hallucinate. And I know that one day will happen, and I wish this is the first project I am hoping to dive into it. By the way, I was like this, like, <laughs> like improved a lot. And, and, and next to many, many <laughs> people, including Bill Gates and beyond. And I received a significant research award as a foreigner student, and this award became a very important moment. Next morning, I got the award, and then Frank Gehry sent his office sent these drawings of the building, and I was able to graduate in 2014. Efsun, my partner, moved to Los Angeles, and we thought that, by the way, legally, I cannot touch this money because as a student, I can't use any research funding, but I kindly ask, can you buy us computers? So with that funding, we got some computers and a bunch of like tables, and we opened our studio in Los Angeles almost 10 years ago. And this is my heroes. Our studio right now can speak 15 language, uh, can, we are 15 people and 10 countries in a small studio. These are my heroes. I want to start with them because the journey from now on is a collaborative work. And my dream was very clear. I was trying to dive in this medium and be sure that I can do it beyond my egocentric work, to collaboratively deep dive in these explorations. And last nine years, I am very grateful to show you that many, many installations happen. Maybe the sound is here a little bit we can open. And what is really inspiring to me over the years, as you can see, the approach was very much the same in this installation here in Kunsthal. I try to make art for anyone, everyone, any age, any background, and any culture. And our works explored performing arts, buildings around the world, big data sets around the world, but artworks in not only museums, but in places like schools, hospitals, airports, places that sometimes we do not think about art. And I find it fascinating to see the people in their life for even a five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, from the function of the building that you go and suddenly change their perspective. Spend a couple of minutes in an airport with a stress to go somewhere or in a, in a hospital waiting for the next hope, or in a school looking for the next inspiration. I found that art can be profoundly, profoundly, quantifiably inspiring. So I'm very grateful that that last nine years, we tried to explore this medium, light as a material, data as a material, and AI as a collaborator. And over the years, what I found that, when these are done right, not just shiny pixels, there is a heavy work behind that. And now in my keynote, I want to show you how we do this, why we do this, and how we can improve this. And these are, by the way, works you can see on my website. So if you have more time, you are welcome to dive into them and look at each of them. But right now, I want to show you a couple of things, which is important, I believe. So it was this project right now here in Kunsthal, Machine Hallucinations. It sounds very funny right now because the current AI research doesn't like hallucination. But for me as an artist, it's an incredible word. I think it's more inspiring than mimicking reality. So 2016, this image next to me happened online. It was a very exciting moment. Finally, finally, we were seeing an image online that is showing this hallucination of an AI image try to replicate some sort of animals or something like that. I don't know how you see that. But what happened here, and, and engineers, by chance, find a way to let machine hallucinate, which is a backpropagation technique, that they allow to create this hallucinative image from the AI that learn animals. And believe me, eight years ago, this was a moment that was very interesting. Because artists like myself working with code, we finally found a, po a moment that maybe AI is kind of not anymore in a player two or a player one <laughs> in the games, or just sci-fi fantasy. It may be happening. And I'm so happy to say that 2016 February, eight years ago, this is Mike Taika, one of a wonderful artist and Google engineer, and Blaise Agora Arcas, from, also from Google, when they did this experiment, they got incredible response from the com community and society. They said very profoundly to open a department inside the Google to be sure that this technology is not a product service, but maybe experiment. So I'm very grateful that they invite me as the first artist in residence and allow me and my team to deep dive in this medium. It's not just like a ready tools. It's not like giving you access. It is more than that. I want to share you a little bit more. 
So the first project we did was this archive dreaming. Seven, eight years ago, I was fascinated by the concept of finally I can work with AI, but what is the input for AI? What should it do? And this is a project in Istanbul happened, thanks to our creative boss of Corton. It's called SALT Research. It's an open free library with 1.7 million documents. Imagine a library with documents, but they did an incredible work and they took every image and died into 49 independent like columns, metadata. So if you go to this library, you can see the, the, the name of the document, who shot it, who recorded it, when and how and why. Amazing research for nine years. And he said, what happens? We simulate, speculate, and archive the dreams. And I mean, it was a really very Borgesian story, I guess, like the Library of Babel. Maybe you know, you know that incredible story. And I was just diving this incredible information. So as you see in that three options, we also explored the idea. But to me, what was really inspiring, if a machine can learn, can it dream, can it hallucinate? And in that eight years, of course, back in time, now it's a much bigger question, but eight years ago, the, 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 the video on the left side is completely AI dreaming all the documents of the archive. It was an interesting moment because we go to a library, which, by the way, I love physical world, I love books, I love libraries. And when I go there, of course, I don't know what exists there. You start with the question. But here we try to think about what happens at a place we go is creating new realities. And the question was, who will define what is real? And that was how it started my journey with machine hallucinations. And the image on the right side also represents that. I thought that if one day AI can dream or can make a painting, I don't believe it needs to think about our Newtonian physics. I thought that these data paintings can use a pigment that doesn't dry and never dry, maybe always in flux. So eight years ago, this study started. And then last almost eight years, we worked with more than 4 billion images and trained more than 300 AI models to really understand these technologies. But we focused only one thing, never used private data. We only focused publicly available data that is focusing on space, nature, urban culture. We look at the cities, we look at the cultural um, heroes, we look at the pioneers of architecture, we look at the buildings, we look at the things that we see every single day that I hope belongs to many people and everyone actually in the world. And, but Carl Sagan has said imagination will often carry us to the worlds that never were, but we thought we go nowhere. So here another breakthrough happened in our studio and we said if we can train AI and we are learning how to do that, what else can we do? And that's when I start to like, think about beyond just data as an information, another information of our life, memories. 2016, when I got the residency, I was so excited in San Francisco, like meeting with these amazing people, and I went back to Istanbul to meet with my family, and in a, in a dinner with my uncle, he forgot where I'm coming from. It was a very heavy hit moment. Like he was the person that you know, helped me to grow, go to schools, and he forgot where I'm coming from. And it was at that dinner that I found that he was diagnosed by Alzheimer's. And when I go back to LA, it was a very heavy hit because coming from you know, all this shiny technology and believing the future and all that stuff, but there was a heavy hit. Uh, the information, the data, the memory of my uncle was not there. And since then, as a studio, we are working with incredible neuroscientists. One of them is Adam Gazzali. You can have a look at him, UCSF professor, who is inventing games to cure ADHD for young minds by making games. Incredible neuroscientist. And I emailed him and said, hey, Adam, is it possible to, to just record the moment of remembering? I'm not talking about the privacy, I'm not like trying to know the memory, the moment of remembering without breaching privacy. And he said, this is a machine called the EEG, and maybe if you can pair with like, you know, other sensors, perhaps you can measure the moment. But he said, we will show you how to do that, but you may need to create the software. So as a studio, we deep dive into this topic, and as a UCLA professor also, I was able to work with 800 people's other metadata, all John Doe, not, not a private data, medical data, without anyone knowing anything about the data, but we were able to create a software that allows us to real time understand the type of the memory, the type of the remembering on the mind, and transform it into 
a body of work called Melting Memories. This was very important because I think in my journey, when I think about data, not thinking about just numbers, but they are beyond that. And this project you see here is in a clinical environment, not just like creating artwork, but also in the hands of scientists, making help them to look at their data different. But what really transformed our research a little bit much more better world, this artwork you see here is called Sense of Healing. And over the last six years, we have been working so hard. And last year, we received an incredible data from the Lausanne Hospital of five children's their uh, brain data, healing their brain data, their disease, and we transformed that fMRI, DTI, and EEG information into five data sculptures. And this image you see here is a documentation from a special event in Capri in UNICEF to donate this artwork. And we donate this artwork to UNICEF and we raised 1.7 million euro for UNICEF for the young minds to be a part of their journey. What I want to share is technology sometimes, truly profoundly, even the artwork is there, but we can make a positive impact. And this work is also on a blockchain, and the artwork has been used in under uh, many positive conditions in hospitals. So our work is literally sometimes starts very advanced in technology, but it may touch a point that I believe sometimes we do not talk too much, but uh, art can positively heal, quantifiably be a part of a different research. So these five work uh, have been uh, transformed into uh, abstract uh, data paintings and sculptures. And it was the largest, I, I think it was the largest uh, auction in the history of UNICEF. And the other works, of course, data can be anywhere. And we have been trying many experiments, as you see here. This time, we are looking for, can we enhance other mediums? For example, here, we are in, in front of an, a media wall in a Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, performing Beethoven's Pisa Solemnis. And this time, in the re re Renaissance era, paintings and sculptures are real-time interacting to the Mr. Solemnus. And so there's so much potential with the machine hallucinations or this concept of AI real-time interacting with us. But one topic that I'm really inspired is the idea of embedding AI into architecture. I think this topic is so fascinating to me because we sometimes forget that the buildings around us, their functions are sometimes locked into the frozen context of life. But I do believe with AI and a purposeful research, many buildings can dream and hallucinate. So one of these inspiration started very early ages, but we, did, we do this through like a many different mediums. Uh, over the years, we transform many buildings, but during the pandemic, I was so much, so much hit by the moment we couldn't go to nature. And in California, in Los Angeles, we had this very much simple hobby to go nature like any of us, national parks. But the morning that all the parks closed, which was the first week of the pandemic, it was a very clear hit. We could go to nature, but can nature come to us? That was a very much the moment that we realized perhaps we can, in that lockdown years, look at nature differently. And I know tulips are very important culturally, but we have 75 million flowers in this research, and we were able to let AI to reconstruct 16,000 species from the Smithsonian archives, open source data you can find, and we were able to create this work. But to me, what was more inspiring, we could hear the AI sound dreaming. We can see the image of the AI dreaming, but could we smell this dream? And it's getting very interesting, I know, but we were able to create this machine, literally, in collaboration with Eric Saracci, a wonderful um, a former CTO of Fermanage, in a pandemic with a single message came and said, we have an AI that nobody uses, and it knows half million scent molecules, should we experiment? So what we did is, let that AI that knows the scent molecules, and our AI knows the flowers, and we bring them together. And what happened was, when you enter this room, it was kind of like letting AI to reconstruct those flowers, the sound, but also the smell of this AI. It was a really exciting experiment. As far as I know, it was the very first time truly three mediums coming together multimodal and reconstructing this moment of awe inspiring space. But again, it's not about replacing nature. It's about loving nature. It's about understanding nature, but thinking a difference in the age of technology. So we receive a beautiful, positive reaction to this research. So we do this type of like experiments in the studio to push the boundaries of imagination, 
with these technologies. And the other part was, of course, on the stage. Now we tried to put the same AI, but this time, when uh, Fazal Sai and his colleague performing, this time we put a similar um, uh, research in, in his rib composition and bring the scent to the audience. It was really poetic to watch AI dreaming and not only just the beautiful music, represent the human and machine collaborations. You will always see in my work that there is not only AI, there is always human and machine collaborations. And sometimes when people now think about AI, we forget how much heavy work there is. And I just want to simply, simply amplify that. The work is a true collaboration. And over the years, this idea of like interactions with the AI, with data, on the stage, in many different platforms, uh, became an exciting research. And over the years, of course, you remember <laughs> my white shorts on the stage. So that project also became real in 2018. And this time, LA Philharmonic, 100 years of institution, they said, we want to celebrate our 100 years, but we don't want to do just a firework. We want to leave for next 100 years a letter, a kind of a statement. And very grateful Frank Gehry and LA Philharmonic, they said, let's make the dream happen. So what happened was we received from Frank Gehry's office the building in three-dimensional data, which is 20 years old, really, really very first type of AI model, and then a, a 3D model. And then we also received every single video, sound, image, music, imagine 100 years, every single information they can record. And this was a really inspiring moment because we were able to finally create an artwork, bless you, that can create a beautiful transformation of the building. Uh, I think this was one of the first examples of using institutional data and AI together. And the other example I want to show today is uh, last year we transformed another hero, um, Anthony Gaudi, a Catalan architect, who is for me one of my heroes, who inspired from nature and created incredible artworks or buildings. And what was amazing is the, um, the Gaudi, uh, the, the building owners invited to tell and talk about their UNESCO heritage building as a canvas. It was an incredible moment for me and studio because we deep dive into his life, his work, but also to celebrate a new concept, living architecture. I do believe architects like Gaudi and many others inspired many generations. And I was very fascinated by their invitation. So what we did is very, really, I think, fun. So the living architecture to me is the question is, can we sense what building senses? For example, the weather conditions. So we put a, uh, maybe, oh, oh my god, it's a red thing. So the, in here, wow, this is, okay. Um, now, now my lecture. So this is a, a weather station. Uh, it's literally sends the weather data, the humidity, the rain, the wind patterns, and the so on. And we took, put a building, uh, in uh, this into the building. And, and the building facade, as you see, is a UNESCO heritage. It's 3D scanned, and one point, maybe one billion small molecules, LiDAR scanning of the building, has to be done to preserve the building. So we took these two data and bring together and created a custom algorithm that can respond to the weather real time. For example, in the center, when it's rainy, the building was responding rain. When it is like a windy, here's the wind response or the humidity. So what I found fascinating is the building itself can transform into this new living architecture uh, if the option given to the, to the building itself. So it was a fascinating experiment and it was a really, really um, different thinking with nature and the building. Maybe the next one, we can open the sound more. I want to show you a quick clip. What we did later, took this idea and project the building itself to make it happen in the form of public art. Maybe we can watch this quick clip.
you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what was very powerful is not the technology, not the AI, but be coming together, 65,000 people in the street, was one of the most inspiring moments of truly seeing the power of public art. There is a major, major potential, and I hope that we do this more often with many artists and activate public spaces. And very similar artwork, now in a different scale, in Las Vegas, this is called the Sphere, an extraordinary, like, a 525 feet, a 9 million small pixels on this building, one of the most inspiring architecture of the world. I hope you can see that. And this opened last September with U2 and Dan Arnowski. I was one of the first artists in resident of this incredible form. It was so different to think that we got used to this two-dimensional world we have, and as an artist working with two dimensions, wrapping around something spherical context, and sensing the, like, the weather data, turning the building into a data sculpture was a fascinating process. It was very hard, but I'm happy to say that it's a magical moment that was like not only thinking of, maybe it's a very Las Vegas dream, to be honest, but it is a really it, one of the unique environments in the world, I think. Um, and it was fascinating to see how the public art in a city like Las Vegas can transform and a very complex engineering behind it. Uh, and, and we have many, many fun, fun experiments we'll show you around the world. And by the way, in the show, you remember the particles that are moving on the blue, blue ones? Actually, that algorithm is around 12 years I'm working with, and in this case, we have to use the same algorithm, but a different data of Las Vegas this time, and, and paint with the, uh, um, paint with the uh, data of the Vegas as well. So, and finally, I want to show about a project that truly changed many things last two years. As an artist working with data and digital work, we, there is many incredible artists have been practicing in the field. But there's always a kind of a, like, this moment of like many things, I think, in the first time happening, always there's some kind of a, you know, denial or rejection <laughs> or that kind of a change in life sometimes brings them. But I want to show you a project that I hope that will inspire also future generations and also like many, many institutions can also host more artists like myself. So in the pandemic, um, uh, creator Paolo Antonelli and Michel Kuo of MoMA and Casey Rias and John Posma invited to really think different. In the pandemic, when the museums were closed, it was a perfect time to experiment. And we were very, very honored to like get invitation to research with an incredible data that is 138,000 artworks in the collection of MoMA. Each work was already in the public since 2017. The data was online on GitHub, but for some reason n nobody uh, tried to experiment with it. But the archive is an extraordinary artist, pioneered many disciplines, photography, videography, even in this archive, there is games. Like Paolo Antonelli were like, like literally, um, uh, I think was the first museum also invited to Pac-Man <laughs> and Tetris and many games as an art form. Like that pioneership in this archive. And I was deeply honored to deep dive this archive. But there is one thing very important to say. My hope was not to mimic this artist, not to try to find another Van Gogh or another like Monet. The idea was, can we really use the dreams and the memories of the building and the archive and find a new vocabulary, a new, new form, new color, new movement? It took us one year to be sure this AI is not copying or doing the same work the other artist does. An extraordinary, unexpected level of research you can think about. And I'm happy to say that by working very hard, we were able to create this artwork that is trying to find new worlds. But what was different is adding a camera and a microphone allowed us to see the movement and hear the, hear the environment. And with the weather data, the artwork was every single day different. It was a very, very hard situation. But like in the Kunsthalle here in the, like the process wall, we also did the same thing and dedicate a one artwork just demystifies what AI does. Why that color happens, why that movement happens, which sensor is giving the chance for AI to create that world. And believe me, this took more than sometimes making the artwork. The reason is very clear. As an artist working with AI, I, I believe we have to demystify AI, we have to show behind the scenes, x-ray the process and show it very clearly, or in sort of in the language of AI. And the beautiful thing is we were able to create three artworks that transformed these like uh, into three chapters that have been never seen before. Uh, and they were every single day dreaming new works. And most interesting part was the museum received close to three million audience 
and like here in Kunsal, very positive reaction, very, very engaging audience across the world. And to me, what was the moment that is very exciting, the work also uh, become a permanent collection mm. piece at MoMA. Why this is important is so funny, by the way. I'm an independent artist. I don't have a gallery representation. It's a very big fight for 12 years. And in the art world, everyone expected to have a gallery, it's some kind of representations and so on. Having an independent artist working with data and AI for certain years, it was a really, really challenging surface. But when it happened, it just showed something that finally, this medium is in a collection. It's a message for other artists that hopefully comes and do mini works. So it's a very important year, I guess, that generative AI, when it's done in that context, it can create a major impact. So, and I'm so happy to say that uh, this is a moment that I hope will be celebrated by many young artists and have a time to think and of course criticize it, of course bring a dialogue and, and, and think about it. The average viewing experience, 38 minutes, and we did a very deep analysis of 32 people and, and, and some Adam Gasly, the, the neuroscientist that I mentioned, and, and the neuroelectrics, we sit together and also measure what exactly happening in the mind. And happy to share very soon the results. So after all these wonderful years of working with incredible institutions and almost like understanding many different concepts of art, in Ecuador, and now in also beautiful Rotterdam, I think we can also add this beautiful reaction. Me and Efsun, my partner, we have been thinking very deeply, what else can we do with this um, situation? How can we take this attention, uh, deeply grateful connection with many people around the world? What else can we do with that? And as we all know, now it's the year of, of generative AI and beyond. And me and Efsun now, we thought that maybe we have one more idea that can think about in a different world. So we call this data land, very childish name, I know, but it's really about data, obsessed with it. But we wanna do something in our own humble, I guess, uh, reality. Try something really fresh and try to become an example, inspiration for people like us, trying to find this, not navigate their paths, also create examples that are positive, ethical, and beyond. So I wanna finish my, um, this um, keynote with a couple of like, what is next moment? So I think we have incredible partners, but what I wanna talk about today in my last part is this idea of nature. This show is also about nature. I am obsessed with nature. Nature is the most intelligent thing we have. Nature is the one thing we need to love and protect. But the current AI research in the world is focusing one thing, human reasoning, which is clearly trying to mimic human intelligence. But when we think about nature, nature is a very, very, very different than our human mind. And current AI research heavily tried to become a co-pilot, assistance and support. But I think all this research that has been going, not talking about nature, and we thought with Epson we can start this research from scratch. So we call it not a large language model, by the way, ChatGPT, Gemini's, and MidJourney, they're basically all large language models trying to like mimic human intelligence. But we wanna do something different and start different. So to do that, we thought that maybe it's time to think about nature from scratch and look at the intelligence of the nature and make an open source to be used in education and research across the world without any borders or whatever of APIs and try to create an, an accessible AI research and data research. So this project is using not only a comfort zones of data, we also, <laughs> we found incredible ultra uh, later and, and somehow contribute this AI research in a, in a beyond like uh, uh, studio uh, research. So what we are calling this um, a large national model, but what is important in this research, we also decide to use sustainable energy while using the AI research. Um, again, thanks to our friends at Google, they allowed us to give us an access a free access to compute power that we know exactly when and why, which computer, how much energy they are using. So it's not blindly putting a number and just like make compute, we exactly have an awareness of every single kilowatt in the research. It is possible, but we need to make a software for it. And thanks to DeepMind friends, they're helping us to like learn how we can do that. And the other parts of course, try to make it for beyond us, beyond art, and these are the, uh, uh, open source archives. I mean, if you want to research, they have incredible open source data. This is not like, you know, current ethical problems, but it's really going to them and finding data, working together with the institutions and their researchers and train this neural network from scratch with, in harmony with the owners of the data. I think that's a very different take on the 
current research. So these are our data sets. If you're interested, I'm happy to share. We have so far around half a billion images and, and authorized by the institutions and the information. And most importantly, we will be demystifying all our four steps to be sure that when it's ready to be shared with the public and the students and the, and the world. And also, and every single like challenging part of AI research will be also transparently shared. I think it's a different, as you may guess, an approach. And additionally, we will be going 16 different rainforests physically and adding more data. So I'm personally in love with rainforests, and thanks to Epson, we have been a very, very, very uh, exciting last eight years of journey in Amazonia and rainforests. That's why we dedicated our first version to rainforests, which is the best biomes in the world that we have to preserve. And they are incredibly rich environments that we can go and find. So simply, this AI research will allow us to create education tools, scientific tools, and eventually support citizen science as much as we can. A safe AI in the school, a safe AI in the museum, an AI that hopefully doesn't hallucinate, but create a true scientific endeavor and make art. So very quick experiments. What you see from now on are all our experiments in these data sets of like what I mentioned. Uh, and they can, it can create very inspiring images uh, that look very similar to like maybe current AI research that people are using from Discord and so on. But we were able to achieve, by the way, we are again, small studio, but there's almost no funding in this research. We were able to create that. And I'm happy to say that for anyone starting AI research, you have a huge chance. The current like research online, current open source archives are incredible. So it's very possible. It takes one year and a heavy work, no sleep, but it is possible to create those worlds. These images are not real, and they can look like real to fantasy. And if you can also make art, like for example, this fantasy world looking like image you see here, or this image, and we can turn this image also into three-dimensional elements. And what we are proposing at Dataland is what happens, we can explore the space in the, in the, in the mind of a machine, and perhaps also go there, see that, explore it. So that's our project at the moment, and hopefully next year, hosted in Los Angeles or somewhere on Earth uh, to show this next project. And, and we have, of course, many, many, many amazing uh, natural uh, beauty, uh, all focusing on rainforest, flora, fauna, and rainforest. And we are already in just one year in this shape. I'm sure next year we will be in a good shape. Also, as you may remember, OpenAI I just recently uh, shared this video model, but we have been doing a very similar text-to-video research last one year. We can type all the flowers of Amazonia, and it can create all of them together and show us the intricate details and, and the beauty in the structures of the flowers. So as you see, I'm a little bit much more f moving forward to like a more real world, and here, are, here is all the animals of Amazonia as well, I mean, and beyond in rainforests around the world, and we are looking for these incredible creatures First, understanding in real, not necessarily try to make hallucination and, and look at this beauty of the life and nature uh, through this new perspective to preserve, to love, to respect, not to replace. And you can see beautiful all these animals that are, exist in this AI model and also in motion as well. So, but of course, there was this also fun, fun place. I love birds, I hope you love birds. But, I mean, they're incredible creatures and I'll, I'll explain why Specifically, I love birds more. But we also have an amazing data from Cornell University. If you look at their website, incredible archive, 50 million entries of bird watchers around the world. And we just get a quarter million Amazonian birds in this AI research. We are now helping them to make a tool for researchers that they, this AI can cluster these beautiful birds. And you can hear them. And, and, and it's a very scientific tool. So you like listen to nature and also know where they come from, where they go. There's a lot of AI research can be used for citizen science, not for hallucinations, for a hands like a, a tool to be used in the research. And this part, especially this bird, I wanna finish my keynote with this bird. So it's not a bird that maybe we can find in a latent space of AI. It's a bird that is a very special name given called Chana. So this is a very special moment for me and also Efsun because last year, Actually, more than last year, a couple of years ago, we met with an incredible family called Yawanawa. They are from Amazonia, Brazil, Acre. They are an incredible people living in harmony in the nature for more than thousands of years. They are indigenous tribe, and me and Efson, we received a very special name. This bird is driven by our young artist, Muka and Nava, and me received a special name by them called Chana Kne. That's my new name given by them. 
Because people are always asking, why am I obsessed with nature? Why is this coming from? I want to just show one simple perspective, an emotion that I feel like everyone, I hope, can feel. Two years ago, we were invited by these two wonderful people, Chief Nishiwaka and Chief Putani, the woman and the man leading their indigenous tribe for years. Chief Nishiwaka is an inspiring human in the entire Amazonia, inspired many indigenous people. He is the very first peaceful person bring peace to his communities without any violence, and he preserved his language, his culture. And Putani is the first woman leader in the entire Amazonia, allowed to bring culture and also preserve language, and most importantly, bring young, young people, the first instruments in the forest. And what is, to me, very fascinating is, when people think about AI, sometimes people think about the data online and like this cold machine somewhere in the cloud. We, Efsun and I, we spent significant time, our time in the deep Amazonia rainforest, to understand, not data, but the people in it. It completely shifts our perspective for many reasons. Number one, which was the most inspiring is, detach from technology and go to the most advanced technology of nature and live with them together. And they open their hearts, they open their house, and we start collaborating the last several years. And here you can see us connected, but also the young minds, very first time doing inc incredible first music with these incredible tools. But they had one thing missing. They had been, by the way, in harmony living for hundreds of years, and they had been very happy with their culture, with the, with the nature in harmony. But the chief Nishiwaka has a one dream. He was trying to bring thousands of all the other Amazonian leaders together for a conference. But in Amazonia, in a rainforest, bringing people together is a significant challenge. And they don't have a museum, they don't have a school. <laughs> and they invited us, can we collaborate? And they love, by the way, Mission Hallucination so much. They found so much connections with their artworks, with their cultures. And I want to finish this keynote with a one artwork that I want to show a different facet of generative AI. These are beautiful paintings done by the young Yavanava artists. They never went to a school. They never read the books that we read. They don't know the history of the art we know. But they have these beautiful drawings they're called kne, which is a technique that they do these graphical and representations of their dreams. And these young artists, 13 to 18 years old artists, allowed us to give their beautiful, precious paintings to create a funding for their life. And of course, this was a limited painting, and we thought that maybe to scale these paintings and, and make them much more funding support, we use generative AI with collaboration with them, letting them how we use it. And we put this, uh, <laughs> if you can see here, another weather station. This time, we took the wind patterns of the rainforest, Amazonia, and get a beautiful like names from their original Yamanawa language, and blend them together, create a 1,000 artworks in harmony, in collaboration ethically, and we donate all these funds, and we raised $2 million for their village on a blockchain. No country, no government, no bank. In the blockchain, open source, transparent, goes to them. And the good news, with this project, they are now able to create their first museum, their first school, and hopefully more. And this project is a moment that I want to remind everyone that generative AI, technology, Everything can be done somehow in our own society. But it's done with the ancestral wisdom. They bring a new perspective. When we blend the ancestral wisdom and the wisdom we have as the westernized world, when they come together, there is a whole new meaning. I truly believe that AI has no future if we do not bring everyone together. And we cannot forget these beautiful people. And they are, when we think about the rainforest, people are saying the lungs of humanity, which is missing something. They are also the hearts of humanity. And the reason I kindly ask you to hold your hands was a dream that I saw in one of my time in the Amazonia. And I thought that to connect us through technology and to find the human in non-human, we need to be inclusive and bring every voice in the world, every human in the world, every creature in the world, in our at least dimension, together. So I want to finish my presentation with the words of my hero, Chief Nishiwaka. He say, it's new times we are living now. Time for forgiveness, time for love, time for spirituality. It's time for humanity to look back to the origins, to the earth, to our hearts, to learn, to love, and respect one another, to make alliances, join forces. This is the moment. Thank
Thank you very much for listening, and I hope to share more. Wow, Jeffy, that is so amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Make yourself comfortable here. Uh, take a seat. Um, wow, you took us on this whole trip from the Commodore 128 to the tech world, to art auctions, <clears throat> to public space, to future ambitions. How is your heart rate doing right now? Data is, <laughs> I'll tell you, 135. <laughs> okay. So better, uh, because mine is racing, because my brain is now in some kind of an yes. overdrive. Sorry for I, a little bit, I, five minutes longer, but sorry. That's not a problem at all, that's not a problem. Don't feel rushed. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, but you already answered a lot of them in your presentation. And uh, I actually wanted to start with just like taking an example by you and harvest, harvest some public available data myself. Uh, and just uh, start with questions from the audience because this event is mainly an opportunity for also <coughs> you to uh, ask questions. Um, so Laila and Vera are here with the mics. Is there anyone who has a question for Rafik? Okay, I see uh, one there uh, with the white sweater, yes? Hello, what is your name and what is your question? Um, hi, uh, I'm Eja. Uh, nice to have you here. And um, yeah, I have been following your artwork since 2018. Oh, thank and you. I, <laughs> since the beginning for me. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I just want to ask you a question. I'm really happy that you had your first exhibition in Netherlands. I hope that it's not going to be the last one, right? Do you have any other intentions to do, like uh, you did in Istanbul, you collaborated with a sports uh, wear brand with a, and the collaboration house. And do you have any intention to do the same thing here in the ne Netherlands? Ab absolutely. I'm, first of all, one more time, so happy to be here, for so happy to be <laughs> in one of the Again, last several weeks and months, I woke up with your beautiful messages coming <laughs> from Rotterdam. Yeah, we've been stalking you for three months and, with and our DMs, <laughs> right? And, 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 and I'm full of joy, and I, I'm very ready, and our energy is 200% for any time to bring public art Good. to anywhere on Earth. So we'll be honored. Okay. Yeah. Good so any <laughs> next ambitions in the Netherlands was the question? Maybe, um, the, maybe the nature research. I hope that we can bring the nature of Netherlands, Netherlands to, the, to, right? the, to the model and maybe bring a beautiful, like, you know, nature, and oh. maybe contribute to the much larger models that go to the schools and education and beyond. So, finger crossed them. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, I saw another question in the same row, uh, I guess. Hi, what is your name? What is your question? Uh, I'm Anne van Gelder, and uh, I'm very happy to see you having a, 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 a medium uh, to preserve, to uh, celebrate and to joy the world as it might be in one, one's dreams. But I want to tell you about a man I met, and he's called John Shipton, and his father was Eric Shipton, the, the greatest adventurer of the world in the 20th century. He invented nothing. He just climbed and the mountains with Hillary, things like that. And his son has a preservation of all the things that disappear in nature, now in Wales. So the world is coming to him instead of what his father did going into the world. Wow. But what I see, what you are doing is so much deeper already in the minds of people, like we used to have LSD, of course, to experience. <laughs> And I did one time, that was enough. <laughs> <laughs> you created your own language model, right? <laughs> so I'm very glad you do this for the whole population of the earth without taking the drugs who are very much into whatever comes my way, you know. But this is not guided as well, I think, but what's happening with the weather, etc. with everything that's solid, and that's so amazing, so beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you from my heart, thank you so much. Much appreciated, thank you.
Thank you so much. <laughs> Maybe that is a, oh, yeah, I see your question. Wait. Maybe that is a nice follow-up question, actually, because, <laughs> um, well, I already mentioned that your installations uh, evoke a, a sense of awe and wonder in me when I saw them for the first time in real life. Uh, what is the emotional or maybe intellectual response that you hope to evoke in people? I think, I think there's, there's one part that I think sometimes um, people are talking like, you know, the world is not just happy like this. Mm -hmm. Of course we have problems, we have, we have wars, we have conflicts, we have personal issues, we have many, many problems. I'm not a visual thinker, I'm not a positive thinker. I'm not ignoring any of them. But what I found truly inspiring, what I found that when our works meets with the people around the world, creates even a second positivity. If our works brings inspiration, joy and hope, that's my ultimate goal, nothing else. But of course, sometimes I also felt that these keynotes like today, maybe people when they don't know like where the artwork comes from, our other like initiatives, like how we are trying our best to like bring the positive impact of technology, education, and creating like funds for people we love and respect that couldn't, like there is so much thing. I think there's two layers, like the, the, the surface is, is, is beautiful and I hope everyone can enjoy, but there is depth. And the depth is the heavy work. So I really, I'm truly wishing that I hope they all connect somewhere on earth that are not just leave behind us shiny pixels, but also that impact that inspires other people. And like the very first moment in, our, in, in the talk that how we connect each other, that I hope that like we can find the language of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an ultimate goal and I think um, um, those are like truly my, from my heart wishes in every single work we do. Uh, and I'm trying my very best to like um, do that across the world without any bias. And the, instead, of uh, instead of differences, I'm trying to look at similarities. And I think that's one way of finding that language. Yeah, thank you. Um, a question in the front here. Hey, can you tell us your name and your question? Hi. My name is Refik. You're also Refik? Yes. Ah, <laughs> great to meet you. Uh, um, uh, we are happy to see you here. Thank um, you. Thank you to Kunstal yeah, for thank you. this uh, event. And my question is, uh, do you have any inspiration in the Netherlands for your art? And what is it? Tulips? No, like the nature is <laughs> in the core. I mean, I, I love nature so much. I mean, I've been in many lectures across the world and, and architecture-wise. In Amsterdam also, and we spent significant time with incredible people in the architecture field. Um, but nature, I mean, preservation in Netherlands is an inspiring, how the land use, how agriculture use, how intelligently even a small space extremely efficiently used to invent incredible techniques for sustainability. I mean, there are so many heroes, uh, so many. Not only artist world, but the technology-wise. I have a deep respect and to the like researchers who have been finding ways to do things efficiently. Mm. Um, and I think that this is a very important part of nature that I didn't see anywhere else that done this level. So I have a, so much nerding <laughs> in, yeah. the, in, the, in the article. Not yet, not yet. Oh, yeah. The question was, did you get a chance to visit any uh, AI or data science uh, not yet, but institutes I, here? In I, I, hope, I hope it starts. Not yet, yeah. officially, but I hope it starts. Yeah, and 90% of the Netherlands is covered in water, so yes. there's a lot of yes. uh, nature to be found yeah. here. Okay, and uh, another, oh, let's do one all the way in the back to, uh, to keep you run, to have you running a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing great, Fiona. Okay, you, did you saw that? Yes, that's one. Hey, Rafik, I'm Fim. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for coming and inspiring all of us. Thank you. Your work really makes me think in ways I've never thought before, and that's always quite a yeah, um, meaningful moment in life, I think. Thank you. Um, and my question to you is, um, how do you make sure that your art really inspires people to love ma nature more instead of uh, it being a substitute for nature? Because mm -hmm. in increasing uh, urbanized societies, I think we do lose our connection with nature more and more, and with VR and digital worlds becoming more ingrained into our lives and with escapism becoming a greater concept and a pathway, especially for the younger generation, I can see uh, a danger, a threat yes. of this becoming a mere substitution instead yes. of an addition. 
Yeah, good question. I incredible question. And again, just one direct. First of all, thank you for the beautiful words. Deeply appreciate it. So as I mentioned, and again, thanks to Epson, <coughs> eight years ago, I witnessed an incredible culture in the deep Amazonia. I, I love technology. I, I love virtual worlds. I love everything about AI and data. But my other half is really in the physical world. And I found that harmony can only happen if we really experience the true function of nature in our life. So in our work, like at least in our next works, that our ultimate goal is truly talk about life in nature and also be sure that <laughs> the machines on our face or TVs and things on our face are not just escapism. While they are functional, they are important, they, are, they will be probably be used in every single day. But can we still inject the love and respect of nature there? Can we still remind the, maybe the people who are in that zones, just remind you that there is that exist, there is nature exist, maybe stories about the nature exist. So I think there are so many ways of doing it. At least me and Efsun, we found that by working with the Yavanawa family. That's only one of the entire Amazonia. And I know that there is many incredible people, the lungs and the hearts of humanity. At least our, at right now, uh, power in our hands, that in our humble world is work with them, uh, tell their work, their life, their culture, their intent. People living in the nature for thousands of years in harmony, like why they do that, how they do that. Um, for example, they live 120 years almost, like they don't have a cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's, or COVID deaths. Like, I mean, there's so much power and love exists in the nature. In our westernized society, we sometimes do not read them then we, of course, find solution to our problems and we got celebrated. <laughs> but actually, maybe there is no problems in somewhere on Earth that is, exists. I think there are so many stories we can share and talk about it. At least as an artist in my work, uh, that's my, my, my humble world that I can bring more. Um, but the large nature model I mentioned you, we were actually two weeks ago in Davos, in Switzerland, at the World Economic Forum, and I'm happy to say that. This is an incredible moment. Some people are saying, like, why are you there? Like, why exactly there? By the way, we were in UN and many other locations to bring attention from the world leaders, but we couldn't find that any connection. I did my very best to do many performances around the world. We couldn't get the same attention. But with Efsun, we were in a room of world leaders of Latin American presidents, ministers, in one room, which will take probably five, ten years to get the Zoom call. <laughs> we were in a one room for one hour, and we discussed preservation of nature, why AI can be helpful for them to like bring together knowledge in the ancestral wisdom, why ancestral wisdom is very important. Me and Efsun, in one room, one hour, with the world leaders of Latin America, in one simple meeting. That may happen in those locations. And um, so those are things we are doing as much as. Yeah. Wherever we are, we just, just a second. <laughs> Can we just meet here and talk about this? We always do that, uh, at least in our humble world. Yeah, that's great to hear. You have a much bigger mission than just bringing beautiful things to the, yes. to the yes. world. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little bit in response to that question, because you mentioned it in your keynote, like technology is changing every day. And as it rapidly evolves, um, how do you see the role of the artist changing uh, to these advancements? I think, I think we are in an era that I'm calling it, um, many names people are finding, but I'm calling this new medium generative reality. Mm -hmm. I think right now, the current AI research at the moment, fascinating, thrilling roller coaster ride for humanity that is every single morning different. So, for example, a, a conventional artist may be using the same brush, same pigment, same canvas, but the ideas may change, right? But for me, every morning is a new morning. Like that tool that yesterday doesn't work, mm -hmm. the new canvas change, I mean the pigment change, everything changes. Like that's a really sometimes uncomfortable feeling for artists and I hear that. Also the new world, um, so, so I know that many creative minds are introverts um, and I know that many of my friends are introverts and I think the new world we are living in us to be extrovert. And I know that there are some differences. But I think where we are going right now will challenge us to question what is reality? And we will challenge like what is creativity? Mm -hmm. But what the one thing I yeah, know... Also because we still sometimes talk about like the real world. Sure. And the, but the digital is sure. not I, also the real, I, right? I think it's an absolutely yeah. current like debate. But I think what is amazingly possible is if the artists have a chance to work with their own data, if create their own AI models, that's a safe, secure, ethical place to be. 
that's hard, I know, but I'm doing my very best to our tech giants, always behind the scenes, like saying, like we need these tools to be public, to be online, to yeah. be accessible. So f with public values. Exactly. Yeah. Because if they are more accessible and open source and ready, the more artists can create their own models, their own data sets, and so on, so on. So that's one solution to many, mm. many problems. Yeah, that's your hacker's heart speaking, right? <laughs> Truly. And then the other thing that I think may happen is, of course, questioning the cre creativity. Mm. But I do believe that whatever happens, bless you, whatever happens, uh, I think being human is still the core essential role. Um, even the current tools have a chance to be extremely intelligent, mimic intelligent, reasoning, logic. I don't believe without human. Yeah, that's what you said with nature. It can be replaced. I, Same I, goes for humanity. It, that and replacement hysteria and paranoia, I completely hear. But it's AI is a mirror for us. I mean, whoever we are, we are seeing exactly what it is. Um, I am putting myself in that condition in the mirror, and that's what I'm trying to see. Um, and, and I believe it's all about human machine collaboration. The yeah. future is human machine collaboration, and that's a harmony and dialogue we have to create. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a one formula, there is no way, but as I mentioned, we have to bring all the voices of humanity, all the voices of humanity. Any more questions? I saw some in the... Ooh, even more questions now. Okay, that question disappeared, but here's a question in the front, second row. Yeah, Laila. Hey there, what is your name and what is your question? My name is Edis and this is my dad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask you if you get any inspiration from painters from like the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century. Oh, I yes. think you already done some research. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. good question. Very good question, of course. I mean, any, any creative mind, I mean, respecting history, I have uh, so much love for early, you know, from Rembrandt to like many heroes who have been like incredibly mimicking this first shadow techniques. Um, like in our work, if you see the, 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 the frame illusion, right? The trompe l'oeil effect. Uh, which a light source feels like the data painting is forming a form. I mean, it's, it's coming from that early ages of like how the pioneers have been finding techniques of shadows and formalization of like details of uh, many things. So deep, deep inspiration. And also we did a project called Renaissance Dreams. So we look at um, the era itself as a, as a, as a painting, um, constantly researching, but deep love and respect for um, heroes of humanity. Yeah, thank you. I saw also one on the fifth row somewhere, Laila, yeah. The person with the glasses. And then also one on the twelfth row. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Jamma, and also my heartbeat now is very racing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, that was really mind-blowing. I really thank loved them. Together with your explanation was uh, really uh, mind-opening. Thank you. Uh, so my question is, how much is it actually possible to interpret the outcome of uh, AI dream or hallucination? And um, um, on, because I was, I was seeing the Casa Batillon now and affected by the wind, and I would say that the AI would imagine that the wind would take the color of the facade because at the end all the color was away, so that, like, an interpretation. And on the same, uh, like, I think that Technology now has uh, kind of been shaped by pioneer ideas back in the days by artists. We show uh, Blade Runner. So, so uh, the second question uh, is: How do you feel this interpretation, this work, affecting maybe the future? As you, as an artist, as also a data scientist, uh, how would you see technology being affected? Thank, Thank you, you very much. So, I think the first one I will say: I mean, the easy, the, the, the easy. Is, so, so I call, I think what we do is data dramatization. I don't think data visualization. Because I feel like data visualization is a very scientific context, requires ground truth, you know, mathematical context, and so on, which is a whole different field. I think what in our work is a more like a dramatization, storytelling maybe in different contexts, uh, not necessarily using our classical Newtonian world or like constructed reality of language that we believe but the ultimate truth, like try to deconstruct all these belief systems, right? Um, so it's more like a data, data dramatization. So it's not like trying to attempt to like um, 
reconstruct a real data on Earth. Um, but in the AI work, of course, it's latent space, right? For everyone, by the way, uh, when AI learns from information, it stores these possibilities of what it can create in a mathematical dimension that's called latent space. This can be 10 to 24 dimension. I mean, of course, as humans, we don't have a capacity for understanding that dimensions. But for example, in our work, that, that this uh, dreamy formalization of movements are coming from latent space. To make that movements, for example, we wrote a custom software called Latent Space Browser, which took five years, still like developing, that allows me to use a joystick, literally. So, so imagine um, Latent Space is in 10 to 24 dimensional space, and the canvas we have is a two-dimensional paper. Um, imagine there's a magnetic relationship between the pix poss possibilities of um, pixels in that space. We can bend this uh, canvas and try to capture machine dreams, mm. something like yeah, that. So you still have some influence on the outcome, right? Yes. So this is, for example, tool making for art making with AI. Um, so that's the only part where we are deep in science of AI to be able to learn, uh, you know, latent space coordinates and so on, so on. In large language models, I think it's more getting interesting because it's more called diffusion diffusion models. They are like very much transformers that can start with a, like a noise. Like a noise is already in our work, it's very common. The noise is I think, mathematically inspiring. It's just, a, 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 I don't know how to call it in a new art, art historian world, but I think noise is also new ways of like abstraction, expressionism, and all type of like heroes in the past exploring with the human mind. I think now we can put the camera in the mind of a machine and reconstruct those noise spaces. I think it's possible to like also reverse engineer uh, the moment of machine creating that specific time and space, for example, uh, in large nature model, what we are trying, if you, if you type the name of the parrot, we want to be sure that which archives are exactly the reason of that reality or dream or hallucination. Because at the moment, current research, all the tools we use, doesn't show us where that output comes from for many reasons. But what we want to try in our research at least, can we show exactly which parameters from which archives, what part of this AI is doing that? Um, and I think it can be a fascinating data sculpture. So that's what we are now creating. But this is, I know it sounds weird, mm -hmm. but it's truly doable to make a data science, apply data sculpture by the moment of dreaming of a machine. Something like that. I know it's a weird answer, but like. <laughs> yeah, what's um, good to know, there's also uh, a part of the exhibit is a movie that also explains the whole creative yes, process. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So definitely go watch that one. Uh, for now, I'm going to look for Frida, program maker. Do we still have some f a few minutes? Yeah, yeah, okay, we are allowed, we are allowed. Because I saw, oh, now I have to choose. One more question over here, let's take the difficult angle. I'm up for a challenge. <laughs> In the black sweater. Hey, what is your question and your name? Uh, hi, my name is Elsje. Uh, thank you very much for your inspiring talk. Thank you. Uh, I got two questions. I, I don't know if, I'm, if there's enough time for, for that. But one is, uh, can you tell a little bit more about your research? Because you say research, but how do you do your research? And another more broad question is, where do you see the world heading in 10 years' time? Because Ooh. a lot of people are afraid of AI and work, and so I was wondering about that. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, we only have one minute, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, let's do the first one first. No, research. I mean, it, honestly, the research part is easy. <laughs> it's being a nerd, I guess. But it, it's really like a, so I think the curiosity is a start part of our main research. Um, sometimes we spend more time when it comes to curating data. So when I talk about like, for example, um, like Smithsonian data sets, right? Like we have 85 million incredible image archive. And taking this data is not a start point. I mean, it, is, it doesn't like make the magic. Um, so as a studio, again, we're a humble group of people. Intentionally, we kept ourselves small to make art because I think true honest art is only can be done in, in, in certain parameters that I have a chance to understand and know and exactly which parameter, which algorithm, which to be really hands-on moment. Um, it's a, like a laboratory with a small group of people. That makes things very slow <laughs> because you don't have a thousand people like other giants can do like things across the whatever. So it's, it's a really slow research when it comes to a small group, but we always start with dialogue with the institutions, with data sets, data scientists. And then when we, once we have these beautiful collaborations, it just have a whole different 
um, start point, ground point. And then we spend so much time by talking with very exciting communities. For example, PyTorch. If anyone here working in the AI communities, it's an incredible open source Linux Foundation supported, meta supported group of people. Jan Lekan is also like one of the heroes of the AI space pushing for open source research. I mean, these are our heroes that a beautiful community constantly helping each other because sometimes, you know, small studio, we, we don't know what is behind the scenes done. Working with open source research is like really the research side. And the other part I think very inspiring is um, artist residencies with those tech giants. So mm. there is always this mystery like what's going on, like what does it mean? For example, when I did my uh, Google residency, they were like challenged me, okay, you will meet with the most important engineer of AI and all that, are you excited? I said, yes, I'm excited, but probably after 10, 15 minutes, we'll talk about boring mathematics of the AI and there won't be any depth. It will turn into like benchmarking, whatever. It is. I kindly say, is it possible to bring Yes, AI engineer, a neuroscientist, artist, and a shaman. <laughs> so, so when four of us sit together, the, that was very different. So this is also research, because we, we love this, like get, bringing together independent um, identities and, and bring them together to discuss yeah. things beyond the technology. And I found the most exciting research with the diversity. Um, it's more, more fun than a GPU or whatever the next <laughs> neural network or whatever the tokenization of whatever, you know, large language model parameter, you know, thing that just changes every morning. Um, so we allow to go back to the fundamentals, the first principles of why we do that. Yeah. Um, Can I save your second question to answer, uh, to end this uh, talk with? That's okay. a very yeah. heavy one, the yeah, second one. Because, uh, <laughs> there was a, I, I, I want to end Thank you very much with that one. Question. Thank you for the question. Um, you just mentioned that collaborative process because um, <clears throat> the studio, uh, if you can adult studio, is now, uh, well, you're existing 10 years this year, right? So congratulations with much. the 10th uh, birthday. And also uh, RASLAB, your studio's research practice, yes. uh, in which, you, uh, which is centered about, uh, around discovering and developing uh, innovative approaches to data narratives. Um, collaboration. Uh, you just mentioned it already a little bit. It seems to be a really big key aspect of all of your uh, work. Um, you mentioned designers, architects, coders, data scientists, other researchers, the shaman even, w and media and technology companies. How do these um, collaborations like influence and enrich all your projects? You already said like I have to bring the diversity of, of people, but also disciplines to it. I think How does it uh, influence the it's, process? It's, it's absolutely another project on top of another project. Because it's really like, some, sometimes, the, for example, like if you look at the LA Philharmonic project, right? Mm -hmm. Institution, non-profit, 400 years running. As a studio in Los Angeles, 15 people. And there's 100 years of all the data that they produce. There is no single way 15 people can work with this data, right? We need somehow to activate another institution who has a resource and, a, and some sort of like capacity, but they never activate before. So I found myself also very much these institutional like diagrams that, okay, here's a challenge, here's the institution, here's a nonprofit, here's, but can we activate this research? Um, and then that's, for example, Google Arts and Culture like said, oh, this is amazing, like here's your Google Cloud support, uh, do you wanna compute 100 years? All like done ethically and perfectly, each institution like connects and understands each other and no problem, in terms of like data sharing and all that stuff, okay, that's done. We send all the emails to all the like heroes of the music ever, like to the Mozart Foundation, Beethoven, and so. And then we got beautiful. Like there is a lot of work when we work with these institutions, and we learn so much. Um, and they because they never come together. Like they're in silos. They're independent silos. Like in the same for large natural model. Like these institutions, incredible museums in the world, but they never connected through this context. I found myself like the first moment and when we hold our hands, it's not so different. It's really like bringing those um, independent entities and, and, and joining the forces. And I think we do it over and over and over and I think uh, each time we discover new serendipity because they never came together. And we don't even know the question yet. Yeah. We don't even know what we and don't know. And with that, gain new insights yeah. on... Yeah. And it opens up a whole new world. And it's so fascinating, so exciting. And when we put our works in the schools, like in Michigan State University and Oregon State University, our works are free and open to the like, students. I mean, a student just emails and say, I saw this work in this like, you know, um, uh, former um, 
energy plan that transform into a school, and I have this dream of like visualizing the, the, the energy consumption of the school, can you help me? Like, this happens. Okay, then we deep dive into what the energy consumption means. Like, can we measure the heartbeat of a building through like that? And then we dive into HVAC. Like, this whole thing is like, there is no like agenda. Yeah. It's just a one email and that, that whole triggers a new role. Yeah. Or a, neuroscien a um, neuroscientist who is like researching the, the emotions. During the Venice Biennale in the pandemic, um, Hashim Sarkis, the creator, invited in the pandemic to make a work. And I said, wow, I'm honored, I'm an architect, but an architect of Biennale, what can we do? So we said, okay, can we make a building about inspiration, joy, and hope? So we dive into the Human Connectome Project data, email all the like, you know, neuroscientists in the pandemic, they send us the data, which is open source, by the way, and then we like, look at, try to visualize the hope and inspiration and joy through fMRI recordings of 6,000 people, and then like, look at this building. So there's like, no agenda, but a one email just triggers everything. Yeah, and this almost sounds also like possibilities are like, infinite, right? So much. Yeah. Um, Collaboration, I think. Yeah, we almost have to end this talk, so we are also able to open this part of the museum for other visitors. Um, I do want to end with your question, Elshid it was, right? Yeah, I do want to end a little bit with your, uh, with your question and a little tweak to it, because the question was um, the future in 10 years or even more. How do you envision the future of interactive and immersive art? And then maybe mm. I want to add particularly in public spaces, because that also makes your work so interesting. You take it outside gallery settings in communal shared spaces, right? I how, I how's it gonna look like? So, so, so ten, 10 years with AI is an impossible to guess. That is yeah, because we saw what happened in eight years, right? So, <laughs> so it, it is a very hard question and, and I do not have the power of guessing what the giants are doing. Yep. But I know one thing, as I mentioned, ethical AI research, ethical, it all starts with data. Yeah, but data. we should have, as citizens, yes. have an influence it, on it, that too, right? It all starts with data. If we understand data, if we know the system, if it's well demystified, I think the society will not have a historia and paranoia. And the more we learn, I hope, the more we have a clarity. The second thing about what I mentioned, like nature, so fundamental. If we love something, we do not want to damage it, like very human instinct. If we love nature through these artworks, through these dialogues, I hope we have much more love and respect to nature. That's my very personal belief that I think, that I hope, I trust humanity is this side. Um, things may go wrong, things may be create uh, problems and impact 100%. Uh, not, let's, let's not be a visual thinker, but I think if we are aware of every single steps, we will become the teachers of teachers, we will become the artists of artists, we will become uh, a, a whole new, I think, dimension will open. Um, but what I'm really hopeful is, I still believe in humanity's capacity of imagination, and that's what is art to me. Uh, and I think that will always be pushed forward, and I think we artists are always the alarm mechanisms of humanity, mm. and I think we will be still showing uh, what may be an exciting future. Uh, I'll be in the positive side. I will be uh, the one that demystifying AI and bringing inspiration, joy, and hope for the next 10 years if I can survive. Yeah. Well, the heart rate is low, yeah. lower again. So in this dimension. Uh, for now, it's, uh, <laughs> in we're this cool. dimension. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can I? Yeah, you can add something more. Can I take a photo with you, like from here? Is it possible? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Asking for data if nobody want to be there. So. <laughs> Privacy. So there's, it's an amazing moment. Is it possible? Okay. Can we also have you? <laughs> sure. I don't know how to do that. I <laughs> <laughs> Says the person that there specialized in AI art, right? Everyone is here. Yes. Thank you yes, so much. Yes, it's ready. Right. <laughs> so, so much.